This is episode 126 of The Variety Artist. This is John Abrams, your host and that guy that interviews successful variety artists from around the world every single week. When I first started putting this all together, I figured my guest today would share all kinds of ways to help us save and prepare for the next financial crisis. But I got so much more. You're not only going to hear the simplest financial plan in the world, but my guest today shares tons of marketing tips as well as financial planning. If you want to make and keep money in this business, Eric is the guy to listen to. Enjoy. Welcome to the Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. He's been called the diplomat of deception, the capital conjurer, the politician's magician, the presidential prestidigitator, and the most honest man in Washington. He spent nearly five decades as a professional magician and a quarter century as a financial expert. Variety artist, the one, the only, Eric Henning. Oh, it's great to be here, John. Let's get to it. Okay, let's start with your magic career then. It's been quite a run, five decades or so? Or almost five decades? Close to it. Yeah, but it'll be whew, five decades in a little over a year. I started in 1972, mm -hmm. um, back when there were still rotary phones and only three channels on TV. Yeah, I started as a kid. I my first, did my first paid show when I was 10, and it was a blue and gold banquet, and I was it, it was a disaster. I was so terrible. Uh, After that, I decided to learn how to do, because I already knew how to do tricks, but I decided to learn how to do a show, and I've been performing uh, ever since. Yeah, I think everybody has that first horrible show. My first show was in a foyer of a ghetto apartment building, all brick, echoey. I was sweating and I was nervous and I was horrible, but I got a check for a hundred bucks. I was super happy. Oh, it was great. And I, and I decided that I was unprepared and I needed to learn how to do a show and not just how to do tricks. There was a difference. Um, and we've all had those experiences. We've all been hired for the country club gig and they put us in front of a wall of mirrors or... The, uh, my favorite, which is the uh, kids show and using the bathroom that right before the show and having the toilet explode and cover me head to toe and you know what. <laughs> oh, lovely. I always win, by the way, when magicians have those contests about who, who had the worst show experience. I haven't heard that one. Oh, and the best thing about it was it was the one time in my entire career that I had brought a change of clothes with me and I was able to clean up and actually did the show. It was miraculous. The, the show must go on, I suppose. But we've all had that experience. So I know, I know what our listeners are, are experiencing. And it, whether they're magicians or face painters or uh, clowns or jugglers, you know, whatever, balloon artists. Oh, my God, I have so much respect for all of them. I used to start, try to do that stuff. I used to try to do balloons. And then I developed a raging latex allergy. And now I just refer all that out because I really don't think you can do everything well. I think you can do one thing. If you're lucky, you can do one thing reasonably well. And if you're smart, yeah. you, you get a group of people that you know in your area that you can trust and you send each other gigs. Yeah, it's a much stronger position too because if somebody's hiring you as a magician and you say, oh yeah, I also do face painting and I also do balloon artist, I think it, it, it negates a little bit of your magicianing. Yeah, it's like really how good can this guy be if he's doing all of this stuff? Now, there, right. you know, I mean, there was a time hundreds of years ago when you had to do all of it, but then you were also the only entertainer these people would, in their village would see in their entire lifetime. So it was a mm. little different situation. And you've been all the way through birthday parties, all the way through big theaters and, and corporate events, the whole thing, right? Yeah, I did street magic in France for a while. I did uh, uh, in Switzerland uh, after I graduated, I got a theater degree, did the Renaissance Festival in Maryland. I've been very fortunate in my career. What brought you to DC? Were you there all along? Well, no, my parents were both naval officers, which is kind of unusual. My dad had been widowed, and they got married in California. And when they got married, he already had a, a son, my brother, from his previous marriage. And so my mom had to resign her commission. That's what they did back then. If there was a minor child in the house, the woman had to, had to cash out. So he stayed in the Navy. He was in naval intelligence. He was one of the first people in the world to get a master's degree in nuclear physics, actually. So we ended up, uh, by the time I was four years old, we were in D.C., in the DC area, because he worked at the Pentagon, became the Navy's top expert on the Soviet space program in the 60s, and then ended up at Fort Meade in Maryland, where, and then he retired when I was about, I guess, six or seven years old. Hmm. And then we were finally in one place for a while, and I got to see a magician at school, and I got to read a biography of Harry Houdini, and I got to get up on stage and do a 
a lip sync routine and get applause for the first time. And all of that started me on this path of going to the library and getting books on magic and, and practicing and doing tricks for my friends. And of course you burn through a lot of material when you're a kid. You, you did that trick yesterday. You need a new trick today. Yeah. And then eventually people said, can you do shows? And by the time I was 17, I was doing municipal contracts. I was doing summers, two shows a day, making a thousand dollars a week in the middle of a recession in the, in the 1970s. Wow. I, I put in my 10,000 hours. I was really bad. If you've been 10 or 12 years old, you're doing magic. You come to a show and you're just barely older than the kids you're performing for. People don't expect much. It's not, you know, it's not how well the dancing bear dances, if you know what I mean. Yep. Once you're in the real world of show business, you really have to have to do it. And I'm not necessarily talking about Vegas or TV. Most of the people in the entertainment business, you're never going to see on TV. You're never going to hear from. And they make a great living. There are people like Ken Scott in Atlanta and uh, Joe Romano here in D.C. who do school shows. And they work nine to five and they make a ton of money. And they have their evenings and weekends off to be with their families. It's a business, but they, they like the hours and it works really well for them. Ken and Joe are great. Yeah, they're wonderful guys. Now, for years you were doing the entertainment thing. What's your financial background or how did that all start? Yeah, I did. Well, I did the I graduated with the Green Theater. Did street magic, came back, and couldn't get a job. It was a recession. It wasn't great. I didn't feel confident enough to try to go into magic full time. So I started doing temp work, and I ended up my second temp job. I was uh, working to set up a computer system for a stockbroker who was selling tax shelters to millionaires. Now, I happen to know about computers because my dad was very involved in computers, and he made sure that I knew about it. Mm -hmm. And so back then, in the early 80s, if you knew about how to run a computer, you had a job. So I computerized this guy's sales and prospecting operation. And then I worked for him and uh, cold called celebrities and executives and diplomats and, and military brass and politicians and uh, learned to talk to anybody without, without fear. And then I apprenticed with him and he was working in this very complicated area of commercial real estate. I was making Xerox copies of these you know, 200 page thick documents and I got bored. So I started reading them. And I started picking the brains of the people that were coming to talk about them. And I learned this stuff. And then I got my license and became a, a stockbroker and then eventually ended it up in my own firm. So for almost 25 years, I was in the financial business full time doing magic on the side. You put together a website or you had or have a website. You're known as in the financial circles as the financial wizard with a tagline. By the way, I love all your taglines. Demystifying money demystifying money. That's right. Well, here's the thing. Here's what I discovered. I don't have a degree in finance. So I learned from experience and I was very fortunate to, because the boss, the guy I apprenticed with was a big deal in the company. I got trained in options trading by the head of the department. I got trained in tax-free bonds by the guy who wrote the tax-free bond code for Pennsylvania. So I had access to these guys and I picked their brains and I figured out what I wanted to do. Uh, one of our board members owned a radio station in Potomac, Maryland, which is one of the fanciest and richest zip codes in America. Yeah. They said, you know, we need a full service thing. We, we'd like to have a business report. So I started doing a daily, I call it in on the phone and it sounded raw, but it also sounded hot off the press, which is what we wanted. And I would do a one minute business report and then get a 30 second ad. And then eventually uh, we did a call-in show, which I did for eight years, over 400 weekly broadcasts. Wow. We did that live. And then we did a newsletter and we did seminars. Um, and we did all those because a guy called in and said, you know, when I was doing just the business report, he said, you know, I heard your call-in show. We didn't have one. And I want to go to your seminars. We didn't have any. Mm -hmm. And I want to see your newsletter. We didn't have any. So I went to the guys and they said, I went to Paul and Dennis and Rick. I'd like to listen to our customers and let them know how they want to be marketed to. Yeah. That's why I'm telling you the story. Because if you listen to your clients, they'll tell you how they want to be marketed to. There are people who are still trying to sell on the phone and their clients just want to email or text or reach them on Instagram. There are people who book all their shows on Instagram. It's unbelievable. But depending on your clientele, they're going to have a preferred way of communicating and a preferred way of getting information from you. You have to pay attention to that. I was just talking to Mario Marchese about that exact same thing last week because he yeah. does mainly children's shows. And all the people that buy from him, they want their content a certain way. We were talking about that exact same thing yep. you know, than your clientele. 
but listening to your clientele, it's the number one thing. Marketing 101, listen to your clientele, give them what they want. They'll tell you how they want you to serve. Look, a very wise man once told me, you don't serve coffee to a guest the way you like coffee. You serve it the way they like it. And there are a lot of entertainers doing things the way they like it, but they're not doing things the way the clients want it. I'm not saying to just pander, but what I'm saying is find out what the need is and do what you do really well in a way that's effective for the client. And it starts with the sale process because when does the show start, John? Oh, when you pick up that phone. Exact. Thank you. The show starts actually starts before that. It starts with the, if they see your website before yeah. they even call the show starts, but the first contact that they have with you is the start of the show. That's why it's important to have a great website because the website is kind of like the reception area in a law firm or a bank or whatever. The nicer that is, the more people are going to be comfortable with it. And you want them to be somewhat impressed, but mainly put at ease. And so if somebody contacts me by email, I return by email. Yeah. If they phone, telephone me, I call them. If they text me, I text them. And if they text wow. me and they say, oh, I want you to pay the caterer, I'll pay you extra, then I report them to the Federal Trade Commission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you delete the spam email. No, no, no. I try to get the, I try to see if, I try to get the credit card number so I can report it and then they can, you know. Oh, it's fun. It's a, it's a fun hobby stringing these guys along. But that's not the point of our interview. Anyway, so yeah, so you got to listen to what they need. With kids shows, and I did mostly birthday parties for most of my career. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you what parents want. Sometimes they just, they want a break. Because, you know, if you're a parent of a toddler, you know that your only break is when the, you have put them in the car seat and you're walking around the car to get into your seat. That's the only break you have in the whole day. They want a break. They want somebody to watch the kids. And yes, glorify babysitter. I understand that. But we get paid well for it. They also want their kids to have their friends in and show their friends a good time and have that kind of social connection. Sometimes all they want, especially if the family's going through a tough time, all they want is that look of delight. When they're really enjoying themselves because you did something just for them. Yeah. The kids show magicians, our family entertainers are the heroes of our business. Yep. They don't get the credit they deserve, but they have the toughest job. And most of us got into it because of seeing one of them. Uh, by the way, years later, when I was helping Al Cohen move his shop from his original location, um, Al came up to me, he said, you knew Dick Gray, Dick Gray just passed away a few years earlier. And he said, you knew Dick Gray, right? And I said, yeah, he's the first magician I ever saw in person. And he said, this was his miser's dream bucket. Oh. The golden bucket that he threw the silver coins in. Yeah. I still have it on my, on my bookshelf. Do you know what it is? It's a five pound coffee can painted black and somebody took Testor's gold model paint and the brush and just spattered it with gold flecks. Wow. It was a coffee can. Now, some people might have been disappointed by that, but I was amazed. I mean, how good a showman do you have to be to convince a bunch of kids that a painted coffee can is pure gold? And by the way, as you were talking, I was thinking about something Danny Orleans uh, told me. He said, today's children's audiences are tomorrow's adult audiences. That's right. Well, let's, let's talk about money. Let's talk about some common misconceptions about money. What are some people's common misconceptions? I think probably the biggest one is they they don't know where to start because they think they have to be an expert before they even begin. And that's not true at all. Well, where, where should we start? Well, the analogy I like to make is that you don't have to know how to design or build an automobile or even how to repair one in order to drive one safely. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is you don't have to be a computer engineer to be a power user. So you start with the basics. There are wonderful books out there. I'm a big Dave Ramsey fan. I think his oh, stuff yeah. is very uh, strong. There's also uh, Peter Lynch who ran the Magellan Fidelity Magellan Fund for years and years. John, anything by John Templeton, mm -hmm. the, Sir John Templeton, the late Sir John Templeton. In any of those guys, John Templeton became famous because in the, in the stock market crash, he bought $100 of every stock on the New York Stock Exchange that was selling for a dollar a share or less and became a millionaire. And then after World War II, he was buying stock in Japanese countries when make it, Made in Japan was still a punchline. So you're suggesting that we start with books? Books, just like magic. Start with books. Start with books that explain how things go. 
I'm going to give you the simplest financial plan in the world. It's not the easiest, but it's simple. Okay. You save 10% of everything that comes in, you give away 10% and you live on the other 80%. Okay. The biggest problem people have is they spend more than they make and they commit to spending more than they are, they are going to make. Wait, you by know, the way, I, what, what you said sounds very simple and it sounds very easy. You know, it's not easy, but it's simple. I want you to repeat that so everybody can understand exactly because, because I've heard this exact advice many, many times. You know, you've heard of the 80, 20 rule, the 80, 10, 10, mm -hmm. you give away 10%, you save 10% and you live on 80%. If you spend less than you make, there's no way you can get into trouble. Yep. And of course, avoid borrowing. And when I say borrowing, I'm talking about unsecured debt like credit cards that are just you're borrowing against future income. So basically, managing money, it's a chore. It's, it's like doing laundry. Nobody, I mean, most people, a lot of people lie awake at night worrying about money. I know I have. I'm sure everybody listening has. Yeah. But nobody lies awake worrying about the laundry. Well, okay, my mother. But most people don't <laughs> lie awake at night worrying about the laundry. It's a chore. The way you do laundry is just like the way you bake bread. It's the same thing with baking bread. It's the same thing with money. It's not a full-time job. You can set up your finances so that you can spend 15, 20 minutes, half an hour a week on it and, and take care of yourself and be fine with it. Now you also wrote in one of, on one of your websites, in one of your blogs, that big companies brainwash in parentheses and quotes uh, us to feel stupid and depend on their own, their advice. I don't have a thousand dollars to put into a retirement account, but I sure do need that latest iPhone. So I'll go ahead and pay a thousand dollars for that. Well, you know, one of the things I do with technology, with iPhones, I buy, as soon as they announce the new one, I buy the previous year's model because they've had a chance to work out all the bugs. I don't like being beta testing for Apple and not getting paid for it. So there's a lot of things you can do. You know, I know people who are using older model phones that work just fine. They work just fine. They make phone calls. They handle email. Mm -hmm. Honestly, uh, you got to decide, you got to prioritize what you spend your money on. And the biggest problem that people, particularly entertainers have with money is they forget that it's not a job, it's a business. Yeah. It's not a job, it's a mm -hmm. business. For example, uh, I, there was a guy, uh, one of my local magic shops years ago, who uh, had been working there and he suddenly disappeared for a few months and then he was back working on the counter. And I said, what happened? He said, oh, I decided to go full time with the magic, but it didn't work. It was the worst job I ever had. Uh. And I said, that's, that's why you failed because you expected to throw a website up or put an ad in the yellow pages and have the phone ring and you just collect your money. That's not how it works. Yeah, you've got to do the marketing. It's a, it's a cliche, but business has twice as many letters as show. If you spend two thirds of your time on the business, uh, then you get to do the shows and you get paid. Look, here's the way to look at it. Your business is booking shows. The sh doing the show is the reward. That's yep. the dessert. That's the fun part. The, that's the reward for running your business. The reward for running your business is doing the shows. And so people can say, oh, well, I can make a full-time living doing birthday parties on the weekends. Well, that doesn't mean you're only working two days a week. You're probably, if you're smart, working eight hours a day during the week to market and to book those shows. You're trying to find the people. You're, maybe you're doing Facebook ads. Maybe you're doing Google uh, AdWords. Whatever it, that you're doing, maybe you're sending nice cards, happy birthday cards to all the kids that you, whose birthday you did last year. You're sending those a month ahead of time to see if you can get either rebooked or a referral. All those little things. Maybe you did a show in a fancy neighborhood. Now you go up and down, you look in a reverse directory at the library or online, and you get the names and addresses of everybody else in the neighborhood. And you send out a wedding style invitation that says, we just did this wonderful show. Here's a quote from a happy mom. We just did a show in your neighborhood. And I'll bet your kids or grandkids would love to have the same kind of service. Here's how to find us. Mm -hmm. You know, something like that. And I would use mail now. There's very little mail volume right now. Email, nobody pays attention to email anymore. If I were starting all over again, I would use physical mail because it's, it's something people don't see that much. They see a lot of junk mail. You actually have a chance to cut through the noise. Yeah, there's so much less competition now than there was 10 years ago with snail mail. Well, I have a little seminar called the uh, five biggest money mistakes that entertainers make. You need to save up, if you're a business owner, you need to save up six months of living expenses in case something happens that interrupts your ability, like you could get sick, you could get in a car accident. And, I, and people just laughed in my face. Literally people came up afterwards and laughed in my face. And they said, you know, this is, I'm always gonna be able to do face painting. Until now. 
Yeah, I, this is one time when I am not happy to be right. Yeah. Because I really wish that everybody had, had, had listened. And some people did, and they're doing really well. I know people who paid attention, and they've spent the last six months living on their savings and prepping. Because the, what they're doing is they're, get, they're building their skills. They're learning how to use Zoom and the other platforms like Google Meet and Microsoft Teams or, and WebEx. They're learning these platforms inside and out. They're learning how to do shows. Basically, we all have to become TV producers now because even when this is over, my sources in the event business and yours too, I think, are, pro are telling us that 30 to 40% of previously live events are going to end up online. They're going to stay online because corporate of clients especially love the safety, the simplicity, and the economy of it. Yeah. And so when they can, they're going to do that. You know, and I know people, I know Vegas headliners who are making really good money right now going on Zoom and at eight in the morning and waking up corporate meetings and doing 15 minutes to get everybody going for the day. Mm. They're just kind of an MC and host or hosting corporate meetings. That's a whole market there. And you can do now, you can do f however many shows a day you want. You don't have to set up. You don't have to take down. You don't have to worry about traffic or gas or any of that stuff. You can do five birthday parties a day on Zoom. Yeah, that, that is the beautiful thing about this is that not only can we market to our, our local area, which is what we did before, but now all of a sudden, instead of me marketing Southern California, I can market across the whole country. In fact, I the, world. I, the world, the world, any, any English speaking country, I can market in you now. Can, you can get up at seven in the morning and do shows on the Eastern, in the Eastern time zone. And then you can go to, you know, you can be still going at 10 at night doing shows in Hawaii. Yeah. It's just amazing. Now you don't necessarily want to exhaust yourself, but the point is that your market is right. Now, now you're, you're not, you're not competing with the local people on gig masters anymore. Your market is the world, but just in the United States, 88,000 kids a day have a birthday in the United <laughs> States. The truth of the matter is there aren't enough quality entertainers to take care of the demand that's out there and we need to get on it. Now, again, this zoom thing, if you live in out of God's knowledge, Wyoming, where there's no magician within 500 miles, this is a godsend because now you can have a magician and your friends can have participate. The kids' friends can, because now it's all on Zoom. And for the first time you can do this. We're really opening up to a lot of new audiences. My point is this, there are a lot of people that are all concerned about, you know, there's no business, there's no business. There's a world of opportunity. There's more business than ever before. You just need to adapt and be able to serve that. Not everybody is interested in adapting, but you're going to have to adapt because if you don't, as I said, if 30, if I'm right and 34 to 40% of corporate events stay online, you won't be able to make a living just doing live shows anymore. You're going to have to become a TV producer and know how to do this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when this first thing came down, I said to myself, well, you know, I'll just wait it out for the next three or four weeks. And then after six months, <laughs> nothing has changed. And uh, now looking at it, uh, all of a sudden we have all sorts of advantages in the future because not only when, when this whole thing dies down, if we're doing live, if, and when we're doing live shows, we can also offer the virtual shows. So we're doing live shows. We can offer virtual shows. We can do it all around the world. It's, it's, it's a whole big. Well, and there are events I'm seeing a lot of like bar mitzvahs are hybrid events where the family's in the same room and all the friends and relatives who are thrilled by the way, at not having to fly in for one day from all over the country are, are there virtually. So there are a lot of hybrid events where you're doing a live show for people in the room and other people are looking in on video. What a great upsell that can be because you're doing it live for the party for the event and then streaming to Uncle Joe in Alabama. Now here's, here's the problem. Uh, a lot of people are like, well, how do I get started on this? The beauty of this is there are tons and tons of resources and many of them have been free. Kennedy just did in mid-September just did a two-day conference on business and how to shift your business. And it was free, two days. He had 12 presentations from top people in the business. And it was absolutely free. And all you had to, if you wanted to pay 50 bucks, you could get the recordings. I mean, that's nothing. Yeah. Jeff McBride School has been doing uh, classes. Right. I know Paul Draper's been doing classes on Zoom shows. In fact, Paul Draper has three downloads on Penguin that are well worth the money. I would highly recommend them. The first one's how to set up your Zoom room. Second one's how, how to choose material. And the, and the third one is how to hire a stage manager because the big secret is you can't do the show and run the tech at the same time. 
Mm. But the beauty of it is that there are TV production people and theatrical people who are out of work who would love to be your stage manager, no matter where they are. They can, they can be sitting anywhere. They can be, you know, if you're in California, they can be in Colorado. You know, if I'm in Maryland, they can be in Michigan. Mm. It doesn't matter. Derek mm. Selinger on YouTube has some great videos on how to set up your Zoom situation and how to do it without spending a lot of money. That's the beauty. You don't have to buy a lot of equipment. You know, if you have a smartphone, you already have a TV studio in your pocket. My studio is in my bedroom because I share my place with my 88-year-old mom and my 14-year-old son, mm. which it sounds like a recipe for a really bad sitcom. And <laughs> I've got I got these cheap blue polyester curtains from Wayfair, and they're perfect for a backdrop. And I have the, the microphone, the, my Blue Yeti, which is like 100 bucks or something on sale. I used that for my podcast before, and I'm just using that now. I didn't really have to buy, you know, much of anything. Honestly, I'm using the, the you'd laugh because if you see my videos, the front light, my main um, key lighting yeah. is just, is my bathroom. I just turn on the light in my bathroom and open <laughs> the door. I mean, it's just, honestly, it just, it's, if you saw it from behind, it's ridiculous. From the front, it looks great. Yeah. But from behind, you can go to washingtonmagic.com and see kind of what, what we've been doing lately. Back to the money thing though. Yeah. The first thing to do is figure out where you are. Write it down. Write down. Get a receipt for everything you spend. And that's going to blow your mind because there are a lot of little uh, expenses that we don't think about. Benjamin Franklin said it best. He said, small leaks sink big ships. You know, that candy bar or that soda or that trip mm -hmm. through the drive through that you forget about, that's what kills your budget because that can add up to a lot of money. I remember before I figured this out, I remember I couldn't figure out why I was in bad financial shape. And then I realized I was, I did the math. I was spending $400 a month on Chinese food. Yeah. My wife and I used to talk about this all the time. I guess her dad used to always say, you're nickel and diamond me to death. And there's some fact in that, some truth in that. Yeah, it, absolutely some truth in that. And the other thing is sit down and write down where the money's going in terms of bills and things. And one of the big, talk about small leaks, all of those subscription things. Do you really need Spotify and Pandora mm. and Apple Music and Amazon Music? Do you need all of them? You know, you know what do you really want to do? Because $10 a month doesn't sound like much until you're doing four or five of these things. And there are even apps that you can get that'll ferret this out. Or there are, the, the other thing is there are apps like, I needed, um, I needed a slideshow maker one time for my son's school. He needed for a project. Yeah. Turns out that thing auto renewed every year for like 85 bucks a year. Ah. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to put a stop to that. But if you, but they're counting on inertia. They're counting on the fact that you won't be paying attention. So now you're looking at your personal spending, you're looking at your bills and you're trying to get that under control and making some decisions. And sometimes you have to decide how many um, big screen TVs can I water ski behind? No, oh, that, that, that's really good advice. Let's back up a little bit because that's really great advice to go through your bank statement and say, you know, how many little $10 charges do I have? How many oh my God. charges do I have? All of a sudden it's $170 a month and that is up, adds up 17, uh, adds $2,000 a year. You know what that is? That's a vacation. That's yeah. your vacation right there. If you think about that, it, well, it's 17, it's $170 a month. Well, no, that's your vacation that you could have had a really nice vacation. Yeah. You could have gone to, gone to that, go, you could have gone to that mountain resort and gone to the spa. Yeah. Or you could have gone to that convention. That would $2,000 would pay for you to go to Magic Live, right? Yep. I don't want to be partisan. MagiFest. Yeah. You know, or any of those things. So, or Magic World. The point is that, you know, you can, and you can still have money for the fun things, but it's all about deciding what you're not going to buy today so that you can buy what you really want tomorrow. Right. Because sometimes the things in front of us, the shiny thing in front of us. Oh, here's a tip. You're going to love this. Go. Oh. Here's a tip that I got from Larry Burkett, and who sadly is no longer with us and did a national financial show. He had this great thing. It's called the impulse buying list. You ready for this? This is great. You take out a piece of paper mm -hmm. and you write at the top the words impulse buying list. Or you do this in the notes function on your phone. And the impulse buying, and you put a one. And then you just leave it blank. And the next time you see something that you never knew existed and can't live without, yeah, you write, you write it down and you write down the, the object, the date, the time, the price, and the store where you found it. You can do this with online stuff too. Mm -hmm. Okay, you with me so far? Yep. Okay, here's the key. The impulse buying list has only one spot on it. And you can only buy the thing once every 30 days. So, 
if you've got something on your impulse buying list and it's been on there for two weeks and then you find some new thing that you never knew existed and suddenly can't live without, you've got a decision to make. You gotta decide, do I wanna keep the old thing? Do I want the old thing more or do I want this new thing more? Because I can't have both. That is maturity. Deferred gratification is the beginning of financial maturity. So you make the, oh, by the way, and if you put the new thing on, the 30 day clock starts all over. Okay. That will keep you from a lot of trouble. Okay. That, that is one tool that saved me financially. Cause boy, boy, howdy, I can spend with the best of them. I can throw money around, man. All it takes is I get an email and somebody's got a new magic table for sale and I'm there. I do the same thing. And now uh, Facebook and, and your websites and everything, they have this retargeting. So if you go on a website and you say, oh, I like it that. It follows you around forever. Yeah, yeah. And and you keep looking at it over and over and over again. And it's, it's an impulse buy. It's something that, that you may yeah. never use. So that's a great idea. Excellent idea. Here, here's what I discovered working in the whole Wall Street industrial complex. There's a whole industry set up to make you feel stupid. You and me feel like we can't handle our money. Uh, but there's a reason why my financial wizard Twitter, Twitter handle is you can do money. You can do this. I, I got to tell you, honestly, the vast majority of people I, I, I knew in Wall Street were dumb as rocks, yeah. but they knew how to play the game. And the game was make people dependent on you. You have to decide. You can do it all yourself. You can be your own investment professional and you can do it. That's going to take more time than 30 minutes a week. That's the equivalent of the guy who loves working on his sports car, right? That's the, the guy, you're not just driving the car. Now you're kind of tinkering with it. Yeah. And so you've got that car that you're tinkering with and that's your hobby and that's fine. So your hobby can be investing and you can do it all yourself. Everyone listening to this is plenty smart enough to do that. Believe me but you may not have the time. You have other things you want to do. You may prefer to run your business. You may prefer to be with your family. The point is there, there are other demands on your time. Mm -hmm. So now you may need to work with professionals. Yeah. And that's why you want to get educated so that you know how to work with a professional. We don't have time to do that here. I should really put that together as do my old seminar for people online so that that people can get that information. Cause it's still, I still know what I know. I'm not in the business anymore. I got nothing to sell. I'm not selling investments or anything like that, or even a newsletter, but I still know what I know. And people still apparently need that information and that knowledge. If, if someone is looking for that kind of knowledge, are you doing any coaching right now? I'm not doing really a f particular financial coaching, but what I am going to do is I have a website called the financial and I'm going to, it's been kind of dormant. I'm going to resurrect it okay. and start taking questions. If somebody goes to that and emails me, I can answer their question in my blog and I will keep their personal information completely private. By the way, there's this great thing that allows small investors to invest just like millionaires. It's called a mutual fund. It's like if you think of an investment portfolio as a pizza with a lot of little pepperonis on it, and they're all different kinds of, and actually different kinds of things. If they're the, the pepperonis might be tech companies, but you might have onions, which might be automobile companies or whatever, all these different industries. So you got the pizza with the warts on it. Being a millionaire, you get to have your own pizza and it can be customized. Right based on your age, how much money you have, the amount of risk you're able to take, all of that. But if you have $100 a month to put away, you can buy your own slice of pizza. It's already been made. And you can figure out which one is appropriate for you. But you can have a professionally managed portfolio for as little as $100 a month. Wow, so is that where you're suggesting someone might start who's never done it before? That's one way. There are also these wonderful apps like Acorn, where you can uh, just take your spare change and, and they buy little fractional shares of stock. Mm. There's also um, uh, one share, I think it's oneshare.com where you can buy one share of stock. You know, if you had bought one share of Apple, you know, in, in 1998, when we recommended it at $18 a share, how would you be doing now? You know, yeah. after all the splits and everything. I have, uh, I had a podcast. And I don't even know if it's still up, but if you look for the financial wizard podcast, there's some good information. I did it for about a year, I guess. By the way, you can listen to those. Those are terrific. I listened to a couple of them. Uh, you can still listen to those on your website, I think. Yeah, they're also, I think they're posted on the website, but they might be on some of the other ones like Anchor or Spotify or whatnot. I'll see if I can get them back up on Apple. You know, those those are helpful. Those are about half an hour long each. And and they're, they're kind of helpful, I hope, because again, I'm trying to talk in plain English to people and kind of meet them where they are. We've been getting kind of deep in the woods here, so we're going to have some fun and get a little silly with fact or something John just made up. Sound like fun? Let's do it. 
Is it fat? Or is it something John just made up? Ah. I'm going to give you a little headline and you're going to tell me whether that headline is true or not. And if it is true, give, uh, give me some facts and a little story about it. All right, we'll do. Let's go. Here we go. First headline, Eric performed on the streets of Paris at gunpoint. That's true. That's true. In 1983, I graduated from college and I'd had about eight years of French. And then I spent a couple of weeks in Paris um, doing street magic. And there's a spot right between Notre Dame and the uh, Centre Pompidou, the art center. And it's this giant square. It's enormous cobblestone square called the um, uh, Place Beaubourg. Mm -hmm. And there were 70, seven zero different street performers going at the same time. There were tarot readers, fire eaters, jugglers, you name it. Wow. There was everybody there. And so you had to compete and you had to get good and you had to get good fast or you starved. And then in the middle of that summer, there were, there had been a bunch of neo-Nazi skinhead riots. Oh. And the mayor imposed a curfew and actually banned public gatherings of more than five people, which really killed street performers. And I saw people getting arrested. Um, and one night I was on the left bank in front of the Place Saint-Michel, in front of that beautiful statue of uh, St. Michael the Archangel defeating a dragon to commemorate the Allied liberation of Paris. And I did uh, a show and I saw the SWAT team, the riot police showed up, surrounded the crowd with paddy wagons, came, came out, I mean, they were bristling with armaments. They were wearing body armor, they had Lexan shields, they had Uzis. These guys were ready. Oh my. And I was terrified. Well, it turns out the French really appreciate art. And if they like your show, they'll leave you alone. Oh. <laughs> so, so they just, they saw my show. <laughs> the, the guy in charge just told them to wrap it up and they took off. Oh. So I'm like, that's the best review I ever got, I think, in my show. Yeah. You, you changed your pants and just went on with the show. Yeah, really. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my. All right. Second headline. Eric performed the White House for the Obamas. Also true, I get a call from some, you know, 14 year old intern who says, are you available? Can you do something? It's a historic venue. It's a Victorian mansion. Are you available? Can you do it? And I said, yeah, sure. What's the gig? He said, well, I'll have my boss call you back. And then the producer of the event called me back and said, you're going to be in this house. You're going to need to, it's famous people. You're going to have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. There's certain restrictions. And I said, it's the White House, isn't it? He said, yeah. Yeah. And I got, I got that gig because they saw my website and they saw that I'd already done two presidential inaugurals. So they knew I could pass the background check. So I said, well, what do you want? He said, I want you to animate or make something animate or float, but you can't attach anything to the floor, the ceiling, the walls, the furniture or the fixtures. Mm -hmm. He said, can you do a dancing handkerchief? I said, not really. Because at that time we didn't have the latest Sean Bagunia creation, which I think this inspired it because he said, okay, you're hired. You obviously know what you're talking about because he had just gotten off the phone with Sean and Sean had told him the same thing. So he said, I want you to come up with an idea and I want to see rehearsal video on YouTube within 48 hours. Cause this is the NFL folks. You got it. This is a Hollywood producer who was doing the entire Halloween party yeah. working with universal studios. And by the way, nobody gets paid for this stuff. Universal studios shelled out probably half a million dollars to do this because it's a prestige gig. And the best thing about it was the year before Tim Burton and Disney had done it with an Alice in Wonderland theme. Mm -hmm. And when president Obama walked in, he's one of these guys that you can hear him before you see him. He walked in and he said, this is better than last year. So we really yeah. wanted to get t-shirts made saying I kicked Tim Burton's butt. Yeah. So we did it. But, but the couple days before the gig, one of my front teeth got knocked out by an accident. And there was, there was two, it was the weekend. There was no way that the dentist could do what he needed to do to get me something. So I had to just kind of wing it. And there's a pic, I have a picture with the Obamas. They actually delayed the party to get pictures with all the cast and crew, very total class. And um, in the picture, if you zoom in enough, you can see the missing tooth because I'm, I'm smiling despite myself. All right, next headline. Eric has taken a promo shot in front of every major landmark in DC. That is not true, but boy, that sounds like a great idea. I have a, I have a routine called Monumental, which is 
a mentalism routine based on the landmarks in DC. And I think it would be great if, if I did that and then turn them into postcards Yeah. with me and every single one of them with the money. I think that would be hilarious. Yeah. So uh, that, that just gave me a great idea. All right. Last headline. Eric danced in the Nutcracker Ballet after major surgery. This is true. I, um, in 1995, I had Crohn's disease for 15 years. So I understand what chronic pain is all about. And I had surgery. I uh, had a bowel resection, which at the time, now they do it laparoscopically in your home the same day. At the time, it was the C-section. You, they, they did the zipper from stem to stern. They opened you entirely up. And so that was definitely major surgery. That was in, I guess it was August 25th, 1995, which was the day that Windows 95 was released. And I got my own little window. <laughs> And then later that fall, I started rehearsals for with the Central Maryland Ballet because they needed men. And I'm not a trained ballet dancer, but what they needed me for was the party scene at the beginning. I did, was in the, the gavotte scene. I danced the gavotte. And of course, with a theater degree, I had learned some of these dances. I knew, I knew how to do a waltz and yeah. all some of these old dances, the Tarantella and all that. So that wasn't that tough for me. The hardest part was finding a costume. They had to build a costume to fit me because I'm pretty big on 6'4". 200 pounds. Oh, so, are you really? I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm a big guy. So yeah, so I danced in Nutcracker Ballet, you know, after major surgery. It was a couple of months after, but still. That was Fact. Ooh. Or something John just made up. Ah. How about a couple of fan questions? Does that sound good? Sure. Yeah, let's go. Every time I interview somebody new, I put on my Facebook group that you can ask me to ask questions of our guests. So here we go. Claude Haggerty said, Eric Henning is a rock star. Yeah, but Claude's great. Claude's a great resource because he taught me how to do school shows and make really good money without having to deal with school bureaucracy or getting any kind of budget from the school itself. And I think since I worked with him, I don't think I've done a school show where I have not netted at least $750 for one night's work. Nice. He's the real deal. He is the real deal. Uh, he's a great guy. Phil Ackerley said, just booked Eric to appear on my show on October 3rd. Woohoo! Yeah, that probably by the time our listeners hear this, that'll be passed. But um, Phil is doing a great thing. He's doing his Saturday night shows and he's got guest performers on to create some variety and texture to the show. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Here's the other thing about that. If it's so great, guesting on other people's shows is a great way to get the confidence to do your own Zoom show because you can do a five or 10 or 15 minute chunk and then have that chunk. You know how we do our shows where we have a, you know, three routines that, that go 15 minutes total and, and you do them over and over again and you get those transitions really smooth. That's a way. Guesting on other people's Zoom shows is a great way, even if you don't get paid anything. It's a great way to get that, that flight time, get that experience. That is a really good idea. Before I let you go, are you performing anywhere and, and how is that transpiring? Well, I'm doing some private shows and I'm guesting on people's shows like Phil Ackerley's, but WashingtonMagic.com is, is kind of the home. See, there's a, a bunch of us in DC that have been doing a dinner show that was sold out 18 months in a row until March. And so what we've been doing is we've done, we took August off, but we've done four monthly online shows and these were each each performer videotaped their segment in advance and our editor Mike Noonan who's a genius cut it all together into about 30 minute or so show and then we premiere it and it still stays on the website I think the one we premiered last week is still up uh, so you can watch all of them and it's fun and we have magicians from Philadelphia to Kuala Lumpur uh, participating well thank you sir for doing my show I really appreciate it Oh, it's my pleasure, John. Again, I really appreciate what you're doing for the community. I think it's things like this that help people realize they're not alone, that everybody's struggling in different ways. And if we can help each other, then that helps everyone. Well, thank you, sir. And thanks to all my variety artists. And tell all your friends about the Variety Artist Podcast. That's how we can spread the word. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist, but your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist, but until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.